Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those sheltering in the dark with us for the first time, welcome. During times of unrest and being confronted with numerous injustices, an important thing to equip yourself with is knowledge. When you are confronted with a point of view which differs from yours, knowledge is the best way to shore yourself up, to make sure that you are on the right path. Local libraries, along with search engines, are really good for getting really good informational sources for becoming knowledgeable. But what about superstitions? Knowledge aids in all things, including that of superstitions. Some people brush off superstitions, but when you're not knowledgeable of superstitions, you do leave yourself open to the entities of lore. And each tale is a shining thread of truth leading into another culture's story. Heed the warnings of folklore, or before you know it, you might quickly slip into the jaws of danger. First, respect others or expect their wrath. Next, will you answer the call of the Banshee? After that, the Baburaka rises to the surface to pull you down. And finally, fan mail for Smile Dog and a case in defense of dogs. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week. As always, the first story you hear is one that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. Then I read a few more stories for the podcast. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. Have you seen any ghosts around your house during the shelter in place? We're wondering what all the spirits have been up to while the houses are filled with people. And if you'd like to support the show and receive bonus content, consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? Beware the old hag. Stories passed down in our families carry with them knowledge of our cultures. These yarns spun can both entertain and also serve as warnings of supernatural entities. One of the most chilling of these tales is that of the old hag of Guyana. My ahi, my grandmother on my father's side, would tell me all kinds of stories of herself as a kid. She's from Guyana a small, mostly West Indian and Caribbean nation in South America. When my ahi was a young teenager, her boyfriend Dalian loved to bother the older widow, Mrs. Benwari, who lived at the edge of their town. Dalian would even sometimes go out of his way to antagonize her with rhymes he'd make up about her. When pressed about it, he'd laugh and say he was just making sure she had company. The old widow would just sit silent, slightly smiling on her rocking chair, finger crocheting projects from sunrise to sunset. Most were very respectful towards her because rumor had it that Mrs. Benwari was an old hag, a voracious creature that would remove its skin at night and fly off under the moon to claim naughty children. What it did with these children, nobody knew for sure. If you ask people why they thought that about Mrs. Benwari, they would shiver and wouldn't have a solid answer. It was just a gut feeling, they'd say. Mrs. Benwari's house was right at the edge of the outskirts, where my ahi and her boyfriend were never supposed to go after dark. Supposedly, there were wild beasts out there. Little did they know, there was nothing out there on four legs that was more dangerous than the widow herself. One day, Dalian was supposed to meet my ahi at the local swimming hole just past Mrs. Benwari's home, but he never arrived. It was out of character for Dalian. Yeah, he was young and enjoyed being the town trickster, but he always kept his promises to meet her. On her way back alone from the swimming hole, my grandmother had noticed that Mrs. Benwari wasn't on her porch that afternoon. Her knitting had also been gone from its usual place on the rocking chair. Asking around, Dalian had last been seen goading the poor old woman, like usual. He'd been heard that afternoon shouting outside her house as he passed. How do you like your babies, Mrs. Benwari? 
roasted or stewed. The next morning, Ahi found a letter tucked under her door. With hurried writing, Dalian explained that he had to get away, that he'd spend the summer with his auntie, far away from their small village. He said that Mrs. Benwari had attacked him after he tried to steal her knitting basket. The letter went on and became even stranger. The widow went crazy and chased me from her porch. I hid in the forest and fell asleep. Hours passed and I was jolted awake. Something was hovering over me. I was face to face with Mrs. Benwari, or at least most of her. Her skin was missing. I saw what lived under the skin. She was transformed and terrifying. I couldn't scream, shocked as the old hag floated over me. The raw sinews of her face stretched into a demented grin. I had no control of my body. I lay petrified. I like them cooked slow. She croaked through bloody teeth. And there the strange letter ended. It wasn't signed, but at the bottom it was smudged and stained dark red. My ahi ran to Mrs. Banwari's house. The knitting basket was in the usual place on her porch along with Mrs. Benwari. Ahi asked her if she'd seen Dalian, and she said the woman's face instantly seemed to change, from polite to menacing. With a blink, it was back to normal again. Then Mrs. Benwari continued on finger crocheting, smiling down at nothing. My Ahi never heard from Dalian again. Neither did his auntie who he was supposed to stay with. To this day, my ahi shivers and says it was the hike. She'd finally had enough hiding behind smiles and had taken him after all. What if I told you you could get high quality organic and non-GMO groceries delivered to your door for a lot less than you're paying now and help out families in need? That's what I'm doing since I discovered Thrive Market. As a proud Thrive Market member, I get the products I love and my paid membership provides a free one for someone in need, like a low-income family, teacher, veteran, or first responder. With Thrive Market, I love that I get free gift choices I can include with my purchases. Also, that they have an organic bath and beauty section perfect for my eco concerns. I got Nourish's Organic Rose Butter, the shea butter not only hydrates my skin wonderfully, thanks to my annual Thrive Market membership, I paid less for it to get delivered than I would buying it in the store. In addition to their membership matching, I love that Thrive Market is also matching donations to their COVID-19 relief fund, dollar for dollar. Try Thrive Market and become a member risk-free. Go to thrivemarket.com slash scary. Join today and you'll get up to $20 in shopping credit towards your first order. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash scary to start your risk-free membership and get up to $20 towards your first order. Thrivemarket.com slash scary. Family trips are supposed to be safe, but not for this family. Left defenseless to the banshee's wails in this story inspired by Solar. From what I hear of the Scottish tales, it's pretty rare to see banshees. They're terribly dangerous. Thank the tides that I didn't quite believe it until I encountered her. I was with my two younger cousins, we weren't raised on superstitions, so as our story unfolded, we weren't able to comprehend the grave danger we were in. It was about three years ago when this happened. I was in Scotland to visit my Aunt Jo and Uncle Ewan with their two young kids, Carter and Poppy. My cousins were a handful. Maybe a little wild, but that's just regular kid behavior from what I could tell. One night... My aunt and uncle decided to go into town for the night with my parents. They left me to watch the kids. We got along well, so I had no trouble with them and we watched some movies. But when it came to bedtime, I wasn't really an expert about that, so I just let them do their own thing, so long as they stayed in the house. I ended up being the one falling asleep. I was woken up by Poppy tugging my arm. She was in her pajamas and her eyes were wide and filled with tears. 
I asked her what was wrong, and she was talking in a hushed whisper, like she was trying to stay hidden from an intruder. There's a scary girl in the closet mirror, she whimpered. Carter's keeping an eye on her so I can get you. I got to my feet, thinking that the kids just had a nightmare or something. I expected it to be a weird reflection of a coat rack, and I flipped the light switch on. There was nothing but a reflection on the sliding mirror doors of the closet. I settled on reading the kids a bedtime story, and they passed out before I reached the last page. When I flipped the light switch off in their room, I glanced at them to make sure they were fast asleep. That's when I saw her. There, on the other side of the mirror, standing between them, was a young and beautiful girl. She was wearing a black cloak of some kind, and her long red hair was pulled back in a neat bun. She rapped on the mirror slowly, smiling lightly. Girl, will you let me in? She asked. Defensively, I stood between the closet and the kids. What was this girl? She looked like she would have gone to high school with me, but there was something about her presence that greatly disturbed me. I asked her what she wanted, wondering if the mirror led to another dimension. The house was near a river, so from what little I could remember about banshees, it was possible. As I thought of the river, it appeared on the surface of the mirrors. The ocean roared, and the waves crashed violently, and it poured rain on the road that had also appeared in the mirror behind her. The banshee wailed over the noise and woke my cousins up. You'll never see them again. Never. Never. What does she mean? My cousin asked, her eyes welling up with tears. That's when we all saw it. The car our parents were traveling in, missing a truck that narrowly hit it and skidding off the road, tumbling over the cliff, crashing into the rocky ocean below. Poppy and Carter sobbed and hid behind me. How dare you show us these horrible things, I shouted at the banshee. Because I'll take you or I'll take them. Which will it be? I knew this was insane. I pulled out my phone to call my parents on their cell, but no answer. It went straight to voicemail, and I begged them to please be careful on the road. The banshee began to wail its death cry, foreboding of a life to be taken. No, I shouted. Leave my family alone. Don't take them, please. Take me. Smiling, the banshee asked me to open the door. I knew there was one thing I could try. I found an aluminum baseball bat standing in the corner, and it wasn't a reliable weapon, but it was still better than nothing. I held the bat up in a defensive manner and swung. Glass shattered, and the young woman crossed over through the cracks in the mirror, but her appearance became haggard. Her hands wrinkly and her hair turned white. She cackled. Foolish child. Carter and Poppy choked back tears and muffled their screams and cries. Leave us alone! I swung my bat at the banshee as she rose into the air. Take me! I demanded, shielding my cousins protectively. I closed my eyes as the banshee jumped on me. The world spun and I felt like I was being swept away. Then, I heard glass flying all around me. I swiped at the air, scratching myself. I didn't understand what was going on. Then, it stopped. I looked ahead and Poppy and Carter ran up to me, but not really me, from where I watched them within the mirror. They ran up to my body. They shook it, and I didn't respond. The banshee looked right at me and screeched in delight as she escaped out the window. And I remain here, but also not here. In the mirror, watching as I was pronounced dead at the scene, seeing my family pack their things and move away, trapped with no freedom in sight. Thank you for inspiring this story, Solar. With the ending of this story, it makes me wonder, do you think that being trapped within that mirror then makes you the new banshee? Will this person never be able to escape? Can they only escape through dragging somebody else into the mirror like they were? And also, would anything have happened to their parents at all? Or was that just a trick 
of a desperate banshee. A perfect night on the lake for fishermen goes awry when they discover their prey for what lies beneath the surface in this story inspired by Nino. Fishing at night is better than fishing at day. At least, that's what Brando told his friend Jijamar as they sat in a boat hoping to catch enough to sell at the market the next day. Ever since Brando's father passed a couple years ago, he'd been helping his mother sell fish at the market during the day and would have to fish in the evenings. A cold breeze swept past and the boat rocked. Jijamar went to check to see if there was a leak anywhere, but after a circle around the small vessel, they found nothing. It was just the two of them, calm waters and the moon's serene light illuminating the night. Caught anything yet? Brando asked. An hour had gone by and still no catch. Nah, Jijamar replied with disappointment. Then, all of a sudden, their boat creaked slowly, side to side. Another sudden change in the still of night, as if the lake was empty. They heard a pitter-patter. A large school of fish swam past, their heads poking above water. Quickly, the two grabbed a net and swung it over the boat to catch a bounty of fish. We're going to be rich, Jijamar shouted. Brando nodded as they pulled the net onto the boat. A lurch pushed Jijamar overboard and he fell into the water. To Brando's surprise, Jijamar stood up. They looked around. The lake water had no reason being this shallow. They were nowhere near the shore. A strange surge of bubbling water drew close to Jijamar. Watch out, Brando shouted. That's when a huge guild creature stood up. Its mouth puckered as it looked down on Jijamar and Brando. It was a Berberoka, the fearsome swamp creature. In an instant, they heard a gurgle and the creature of legend spewed lake water onto Jijamar, pushing him under. Brando grabbed a hook and shouted at his friend to swim to it, but every stroke Jijamar tried to swim, the water coming out of the creature's mouth continued to dump on him, full force almost drowning him from the sheer weight over him. Gasping, Jijamar reached the hook and Brando pulled him to the boat. The creature belched out another shaft of water that made the boat tumble forward. Jijamar struggled getting up for air. He hit his head on the boat and could feel the pain of it, but the need for air encouraged him to get on his feet. Brando reached for him. The lake began to fill up around them. Brando rushed to the motor to get the boat to shore, but the boat began to capsize from water spilling into it. They looked back and the Berberoka was clawing on board, its big hollow eyes furrowed in anger and its enormous wide mouth agape. The water rushed toward Brando like a current he couldn't fight off. Jijamar grabbed the wheel to turn them. Brando grabbed the hook as he was swept into the waters of the Berberoka's mouth and stabbed the creature, knocking it off the boat, but not before getting his leg caught in his jaws. Brando screamed as his foot was crushed between the jaws of the injured Berberoka. Staring in horror, Jijamar ran to Brando as the boat floated to the shore. There was so much blood. Brando was slipping away and the boat tipped over, knocking Jijamar into the mouth of the Berberoka. The snapping of bones and cries were the last things Brando heard and saw as Jijamar was eaten right before his eyes. Brando was already dead by the time the creature got to him. The next day, the boat floated to shore with a full net of dead fish and covered in the blood of the fishermen who never made it home to sell their big bounty. I will say, Nino, hearing this aquatic story of horror does make me miss the beach and going to lakes a little less, so thank you for that. In fact, maybe we should hear some more tales like this. Something that'll help us think twice before going to the beach or boating with large groups of friends. So with summer on the horizon, we'd like to hear more aquatic horror. Send us your stories if you've got them. Something scary at snarled.com.
Our recent creepypasta reading of Smile Dog got quite the response. We have a letter from a fan's experience with Smile.Dog. Then we'll conclude this episode by reading a story inspired by another listener, Anna Sophia, who hopes to redeem man's best friend. Dear Marquia, first of all, I just want to say that I love your podcast. I am writing this to you because while listening to your most recent podcast, I noticed something. When you described the dog, I realized that I had seen it before way back when I was a toddler and got rid of it without passing it on and would like to share it in case anyone who might be going through a similar experience and needed some advice. In 2008, I was a first grade student, but my school, being the advanced school it was, believed that all students should have basic computer knowledge and we were trained to use a computer since a young age. So one day they were teaching us to use email. Since we were still young, the teachers would enter the email address, which would normally be of the PC right next to us. After finishing my random email with a random file attached, I sent it to my friend right next to me. My inbox dinged, and one of the teachers came and asked me to open it. To this day, I wished I hadn't. As soon as I opened the file, that horrible dog's photo filled my computer screen. I was terrified and started screaming and fell off of my chair, sobbing uncontrollably. I was really traumatized and had to be sent home. The school later released a statement saying that the mail was from an anonymous, unknown sender. After that, the dog started visiting me in my dreams, and I tried to say something, but I never understood what it was trying to say. But things got worse when he started doing more than just talking. One time, I was sliding down a slide, and it was at the end, and I woke up, and one time, it ate my tiny fist and a lot more. I started to sleep in my parents' room and had to consult a child psychiatrist. After a few sessions, my nightmares ended, but it came with a price. I was a cheerful person, but now I have lost all of my self-confidence, and I've developed a weird habit of pinching my mom's elbows when I'm nervous. And when she's not around, I pinch myself. My elbows have scars all over them. After listening to your story, I googled it, and sure enough, it was the same dog. But this time, I'm all right, maybe because my brain was expecting it. But if you read this, and anyone is listening, please don't go after that dog. It has managed to make me develop a certain kind of dog phobia towards the dogs which are a bit familiar in appearance. Regards. Anushri Sangani from India. Anushri, thank you for your warning and thank you also for sharing your experience with us. Man's Best Friend by Anna Sophia. I saw the latest video and I feel that dogs deserve a redemption. My name is Anna Sophia and this story is inspired by my dog and her annoying habit of barking at the neighbors. None of the events actually happened to me. I'm just a girl who wants to be a writer and is exploring different genres. I really love my dog, Leota, but there are days when she can be so annoying. Like when I'm eating a snack and she gives me a look, begging for a piece of my food. Or when I put on a sweater and she'd nip at the sleeves. But the worst of it was her barking. Leota would bark when she heard someone entering the building, like when my mom got home. But most of all, she'd bark at neighbors. Specifically, one neighbor who lived next door. I don't want to share his name, so we'll call him Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter had lived on the block since I was a baby, and my dog would always bark at him whenever they crossed paths. Mr. Carter, however, didn't mind. He would always smile and tell me it's okay every time I apologized. You have a special dog, he would say. Hold on to this one. One day, I came back from school to find my mom home early from work, watching the news with my grandparents. There were no updates on that girl who went missing two months ago. She was about my age and wore a yellow scrunchie in her hair. My dog ran up to me and crouched, and I gave her a good scratch behind the ears. She was happy to see me, and I was happy to see her. 
When they showed a close-up of the girl, Leota's behavior changed suddenly. She looked worried and whined sadly. Sweetie, can you go walk the dog? My mom asked me, her eyes still glued on the TV. Sure, mom. I took Leota out of the living room and clipped on her leash to walk her around the block. The day was still. There was barely anyone outside, and I kind of liked the peace on the street. Not even a minute had gone by when that peace was immediately disrupted by Leota's barking. To no surprise, we were in front of Mr. Carter's house. I tried to pull Leota along, but she would not budge. Instead, she continued on barking and growling at the direction towards the house, pulling her leash, trying to break free. We were in a bit of a tug of war. I tried to pull her back with all my strength, but she just kept on growling and barking to break free. What was wrong with my dog? I know she hates Mr. Carter, but this is ridiculous. Suddenly, the leash ripped out of my hand. I lost my balance and fell forward, scraping my knee. My dog just ran into Mr. Carter's backyard through the side entrance. Ignoring the pain in my knee, I limped after Leota, fuming with anger. Luckily, Mr. Carter wasn't home. I figured I'd just grab my dog and leave. I reached the backyard to find Leota digging in the flower bed. I'd never seen her do anything like that before. Running to her, I quickly clipped her leash back on when I noticed a yellow scrunchie in her mouth. When I pulled it out, I noticed it was caked with not only mud, but the dark red tinge of dried blood. My dog barked and whimpered as I looked down at the dirt. Sticking out of the flower bed was a small, decaying hand. Oh my God, I thought. I have to get out of here. A hand touched my shoulder, and a chill ran down my back. I turned to see Mr. Carter. He had a blank expression on his face, but his eyes held something sadistic. You ruined my garden, he spoke. His grip on my shoulder tightened. I couldn't say anything. I was paralyzed with fear. That's when my dog growled and leaped up on her back legs, biting down on Mr. Carter's hand. He released my shoulder. I sprang up from my knees, grabbing a nearby stone and hit his head hard with it, knocking him back. Leota then jumped into my arms and we ran off. Taking the opportunity, I screamed for help. My mom and grandpa ran out to our backyard next door and quickly intervened. I was saved. My dog knew what was going on. She'd tried to warn us and I didn't listen to her. She'd saved the day. Mr. Carter was detained, and the body Leota found in his yard was that of the girl who'd gone missing. I guess it's true what they say. Dogs are a man's best friend. This week's podcast stories were edited by Sabina Graves and Marquia McCarty. Narration by Marquia McCarty. Audio edited by Fitz Harris and Calvin Linderman. Graphics by Johnny Ashley. Produced by Annalise Nelson. Music by Sapphire Sandalo. If you have a story you'd like to submit, send me an email at somethingscary@snarl.com. Don't forget to watch the video version of Something Scary over at youtube.com slash snarled. And if you'd like to support the show and everything we do at Snarled, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash snarled. Until next time, my dark darlings, sweet dreams.